our conversation. I could help. Uh, I could help. Uh, maybe not me directly, but my, some of my uh, collaborators could help with the curriculum framing, if you will, because we, we've done it once last year. So that might be helpful. I shared a document I, in terms of like how do we explain in words that are understandable the idea that it's an experiential learning uh, process. I think I find that part interesting. So maybe I can help there somehow. Um, and forgive me, I'm still catching up to the, the world of Wiki. Um, and so I'm capturing most of this on Excel. Um, yeah. Would it be helpful if I shared my screen? Do we want to? I would suggest we do a live editable slides presentation. Paul, what do you think? Is that appropriate? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I can pull so, that up. So, John, are you familiar with slides? Uh, Google Slides. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm opening one up now. Let's open one up. I, th I thought the idea was that I'm going to just start spewing forth information and we're doing like what we're doing in an apprenticeship. Um, and uh, is this really like where you're trying to learn and, and put down the curriculum on paper? Yeah, uh, the first conversation that I have with employers goes like this. You tell the story of your vision from the perspective of the student or the apprentice. And you just, you literally just tell the story and I'm taking notes and then the structure comes later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we can take notes together. <laughs> there you go. Sweet. So Is this don't mind me, I'm- go home? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Um, what's the scope? Is that a question? How far are we you? scoping at CD Go Home? There's Global Village Construction Set Open Source Ecology. Ecology, <laughs> there's specifically more towards like a longer four year program that would be relevant to a university. Let's see, my sound is. Can you guys speak now? Yes, hi. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, so I'm getting this double thing here, but okay. Um, yeah. Let's, you're you're uh, logged in two places. That's the issue because the sound was not picking up for me on Zoom here, so I was going to my cell phone. Uh, that's what I was doing. But can you guys, um, I can hear you well on the cell phone here, so. Great. Okay. Let's just do that part. Um, so my recommendation would be, um, you know, s start from the perspective of you. You just met me off the street. I don't know anything about OSC, and so what are the what are the? I guess, start there. I guess I don't want to lead. Start there. Um, are we talking about curriculum that's going to be when we were talking about vets and this? We're going to frame that into like one to four year curriculum like this is the real the big thing or how big is this yeah yeah let's go big if we have to drill down i mean we just literally pick a place to start it doesn't um because we're gonna iterate and and i'm gonna help redirect as we go forward so yeah i would yeah, yeah. well let's let's do let's focus on the cd go home because that's the product that we're saying there's a lot of education around it but also it's a tangible thing if we talk about um real livelihood that is the thing that's got the most potential right now and i'm you know i'm just getting right back there from building the house we got our apprenticeship going on so i just cut out but it's good stuff man it's i, I feel good about it because i feel the connection of the digital to the real world in a sense that well we we spent a bunch of time on cad and people were like getting pissed and tired of it but now we're building it. And I think there's that reality check that people are getting into that, oh, wow, this is actually something very tangible. And I feel like some of the people who weren't super theoretical, who are very practical minded, like they're not abstract thinkers. They're like, oh yeah, now I get it. And they're moving forward. So I think, uh, I think that part is great. Uh, that's just my immediate feedback on this. And if we make it digital, just as like, you know, like Diamandis 5Ds digitized to democratize kind of thing, um 
all that stuff, I feel the connection has to be made clear that, okay, if you do a digi full digital treatment of this, then it can scale in massive ways and open source, digital, scalable in massive ways. So that's, that's how I come into it as we're actually going to solve housing because by principles of open source, uh, just open source in general, if you have enough eyeballs looking at a problem, you, you end up doing better. And that's the only way you can do it. Um, if you talk about actually solving real problems, you have to collaborate openly and transcend the current, say, uh, like the academic model, which is all proprietary. It's proprietary. Like you don't get to learn the best stuff because the best stuff is secret. Now we get to transcend that and create, as we go about creating this funky course, however it's going to look, we are actively transforming systems. So that's that's kind of how I want to, a little, little meta note on how we approach this or how I think about it at least. Okay. Um, let's go even simpler. You just met me off the street. What is the Seed Eco Home? Yeah, the Seed Eco Home is a, it's a thousand square foot house that's designed to be the easiest, simplest, fastest, lowest cost to build. And it's doable by individuals who are just learning for the first time. It's easy enough that it doesn't require special special skill. We teach it. Or it's it's doable for regular commercial grade construction. Like we're designing it so it's extremely efficient. Uh, it's got a lot of good features, ecological. The, one, some of the greatest features, in my view, is the expandability, modularity, scalability expandability in that right now we're designing just as an example we framed in two doors that expand this house from a thousand square feet to two thousand square feet readily okay. now you can also scale, scale down so you talk about micro homes from units of 256 square feet and up so think about that as units um that scale and by the way i am recording this so we can uh, definitely review this are you guys recording on your side or anything like that no, no. Yes. Uh, can I you am. shift the link, uh, Jonathan, to share, make it public editable? Uh, sure. Let me. Upper right hand corner, share. Uh, too, too high up. Like next to the J on the right side, top right, inside the, the, the main uh, cabin. Okay. Sorry, the chair, the yellow. The yellow yeah. sign there. I, I think yellow. you're. Are you seeing something? I'm not. Oh, oh, this one. Oh, oh, the slide. Sorry, excuse okay. me. I'm embarrassed. Uh, uh, share it. Yeah, don't do that. Do public. Public. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> Go down to get share. It might not be possible. Anyone. 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 Edit. Editor. Sweet. Oh, yeah. Oh, we, okay. And if you put it in the chat, that's great. I'll get to it. Sorry, John. Did you say you are recording? I am. Great. Because I am too. Okay. So, <clears throat> how, day one of the program, where do you start with somebody who's never done this before to get them to the point where they're implementing this well if if we were down the future then i would like to see augmented reality or extended reality mixed reality assist so we don't have to go through the kind of sweat we have right now depends how fast you want to learn it. if you want to learn it fast as in we talk about swarm builds with people off the street then that kind of infrastructure would help but if you're just starting and you have, say, regular tools, like you have CAD tools, you've got access to computers, you're, say, in an immersion program, then it's about going between CAD and building if you're doing a program of design build. So where do you start? You'd probably start by going through the, the digital model of the house, which is on the wiki. So let's see what... Where do I find this doc? Did you chat? It's in the chat, definitely, right? Correct. So, 
So I'm gonna I can also pipe in some links there. So so the first thing you gotta do is so we develop it on a wiki using a template, a development template that's got all the different assets of that's that are relevant to product development. So you probably want to start with that. Um, so if you talk about this template, um, uh, but that's the for the seed eco home development. In it, you got a load of that's now you've d dived, you dove into like thousands of pages and hundreds of CAD files. And it's, it's linked there. Like, for example, in a development template, you have links for CAD, build procedure, design rationales, da data, all of that, the standard stuff of product development. So if, if I want, wanted to take a, if I have the, okay, I, I want to go to the, the audience of a person that can help me right now. And a, and a person that can help me right now, I would say is, say it's the, the four-year student that we can get into this program through GI Bill and they're diving into it and they're coming into the program with intent to uh, at least some kind of ethical or, or world-changing ideals. So I would want them to know design and build because that integrates already a part of what's highly disintegrated in society. Like the designers are not the builders or like the engineers are not the designers, the builders are not the users, all that kind of break. We are integrating here. So we, we teach people the whole value chain as part of a generalist mindset for how we go about this with respect to the transformative nature of this work. So it's it's like we're gonna create like if we if we're gonna solve housing here so starting with kind of the greater vision if we're gonna solve housing first of all we have to know what that means but then take a very integrated approach i would say the the concept of integration of many different fields and integration of open source that you're getting feedback from all kinds of people all walks of life and then they're all collaborating towards ultimately a business model a, re a revenue model because at the end of the day, it's like it could be a project or it can be a product. Products are what the economy is made of. So we got to go after products. And we develop to the point that it becomes the best. Um, so I want people to have a very integrated um, training here. So they t at least touch on. So they definitely want to build this thing because that's the ultimate reality. You're going to build this, but then you have to answer the whys. Why are you doing this? So uh, I think to start with the the why we have to start with what is solving housing so once again going to the wiki um what is solving housing there it is uh so there's some notes on it it's an open doc once again everything is open here so people are want to edit that um so we go to what is solving housing well, first you're going to have a good product. It has to be the easiest, like what I described, it's easiest, fastest, cheapest, most ecological, most innovative, uses natural materials, closed loop material cycles, product productivity, such as energy production and food production, and even water production for, through a closed loop water system. That's some of the latest. And the super latest is actually connecting this to solar hydrogen, because I just went through the numbers and this is kind of like, this is kind of like the, the the water hose here, the more the fire hose. I just went through through hydrogen numbers and with the kind of low cost PV panels that you can get today, you can make a system like that feasible even on a home scale, I believe. So not using fuel cells, but using internal combustion engines. So, so get rid of batteries. I talked about nickel iron batteries for the home. That's part of the technologies. Um, but last weekend I went through the numbers and I found that... Um, for the, the human species, we can only do that for 1 billion people. So actually nickel is a, uh, it's not scarce, but it's not easy to, to mine because most of it is in the core. 
on a plant is extremely abundant, but most of it is in the core. So nickel iron batteries can practically today go uh, set, set up like a billion people to off-grid energy systems. The question right now being, okay, how do you do off-grid energy as an addition to this house? Well, uh, you can be talking about this house that gets you not only the living space, but productivity. I mentioned food, energy, fuel. With a micro factory, you get into into productivity of of uh, basically household like distributed manufacturing. So that's that's the vision behind the house. Um, now, the only way we're going to realize what we just said is through global collaboration. Can I inter sort of redirect here? Please. So the the end state for curriculum development from the perspective of GI Bill approval is mm -hmm. much, much lower level thinking. It's almost a task list and the amount of hours you think the student is going to contribute or commit to that task. So um, take for granted just for the you know sake of this meeting that your vision will be preserved and all you're doing is communicating literally what the students are going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis over that, let's call it two-year period. And so... Uh, sorry, you said the vision will be preserved? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, I operate under the, the assumption that all, all we're trying to do is to convince the government that what you're doing is not... <laughs> that you're not, you're not a huckster. Like you're, the students are actually going to be doing things and the way that they validate yeah. whether or not you're actually doing things is you have a task list that they must complete over the two years, which I know is sort of counter to the, the whole applied learning model, but that's kind of the exercise we have to go through if we mm -hmm. want to go down this, this approval route. And so what I, so to give you an example, so like you, you have design, build, implement, let's say during the design phase, you're trying to explain the why. And so you bring all the students in for the first couple of weeks of, of an orientation in which you sort of lay out the vision, the value chain, you, you explain the process and, and the why behind what they're about to do. And then you go into the engineering process of what are the characteristics we want of the house? This is how we arrived at the material selection and all these other things. And now we're going to go to CAD. And so we're through CAD, we're going to combine what we want with the terrain on the ground and you know, you're know you gonna have to teach people CAD. So there's gonna be some tasks associated with that and so on. And eventually you're gonna get to build in which they're gonna have to spend hours wearing their tool belt, framing doors, like you said, putting in windows, framing. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the level at which the end product needs to be. Um, I'm not sure. Is, is this helping? Is this, is this confusing? Yeah, no, that's, that's right. And yeah, yeah. Now my only, uh, question would be, so, so for, um, okay. So this is GI bill stuff where, um, who are we, let's get clarity on, on like who we need to satisfy in terms of curriculum, because I would like to, like we, John, we talked about, okay, so we, we, we get people who are a little different, maybe like we talked about the idea that the people who wouldn't take advantage of college perhaps might be some people who say, oh, well, I don't want to be put into back, back into the system. Maybe <clears throat> people are disillusioned about it. So how do we start framing this around a more integrated thing that meets say the veterans where they are but also allows them to do to get into the transformative stuff so, so obviously there's school there's like you're learning skills but how much can we go in terms of there's our a, a definite r d component according to the principle that genius is this one percent inspiration 99 percent perspiration so we we have curriculum but then we get into art, like as quickly as people learn, they can start innovating because there's so many things to innovate upon. Yep. Uh, so it, is this consistent? It, yes. It, we want to think about it in two separate audiences. 
to the veteran audience slash student audience, you're going to be communicating your vision along the lines that you have since the meeting started. You're talking about open source collaboration, innovation, applied learning, um, all, all the, the holistic vision for the future. For the government approval audience, we want to be thinking digestible bits that form a coherent picture about what a student does from when they start and where they are when they graduate. So, so the, the government picture is just a very distilled down version of what you're talking about with augment, you know, like the, the integration of so many different uh, concepts and skills and experiences. Yeah, yeah. And another question is, so are we thinking in terms of also satisfying a customer such as UMKC, who we can collaborate with, as, as I mentioned about the idea where we're saying we're going to feed people into to enroll at UMKC. So are we going for our, this as certification for ourselves or the route where we're preparing that curriculum for UMKC where people enroll, for example, at a UMKC? And when I say UMKC, that's because we had the meeting with the dean who was open to this idea. But after afterthought is this can apply anywhere, right? So we can pitch this as an idea that we're effectively bringing people to somebody's door in a collaborative sense, we're partnering with some university or some institution, which does effectively the, the bureaucratic part, and we collaborate with, they, they take care of all that. They have the, the actual status of accepting GI Bill, and we collaborate with them to actually deliver the program. So which, which framework are we talking about here? I think that the, the government framework is a necessary but not sufficient condition for a university type partnership. The challenge with the university type partnership, unless I miss something, is um, if they don't own it completely, i.e. if they don't hire you as a professor, then their GI Bill approval is inaccessible to us. And so it, it behooves us, I think, to start the clock as early as possible, which means OSE is a approved entity. Um, and getting to that point could take several different paths. Uh, we talk about education and labor and then on the job training, which is a subset of labor um, that is less restrictive. But the, the bare minimum to get to the next step for approval for OSE is, uh, government level task list that is a distilled version. And the you incorporate the vision when you're having the conversation and the, going through the selection process for the actual people that you want involved day to day. But essentially, with the, you know, I hate to say it, but this is essentially a check the box for the government. It, it, you don't have to sell the vision to the government, fortunately. All you have to do is, is uh, demonstrate a certain amount of due diligence with respect to, you know, labor practices. And a, fr and a time frame here is about two years. Well, it, de it depends two years for education and I'm still waiting to hear back from my contact at the department of labor about how we turn this into a registered apprenticeship. And then the backup plan is on the job training, which uh, the, whereas a, a Department of Labor apprenticeship is a two-year length training program, on-the-job training can be as short as six months. So the, the existing apprenticeship that you have now that I believe is six months could, if we just put that into a task list of what the students are doing from when they show up to when they graduate, which you're pretty darn close to on the website from what I could see, um, you could get GI Bill approval before then. The only the distinction is that when the student graduates under the on the job training program, they don't receive a nationally recognized credential, which you know also goes back into our discussion about the importance of credentials or not. It's it, it's it's kind of a you know it, it's not a game stopper for you. Um, yeah, but let's let's clarify some distinctions because because the the apprenticeship route just to clarify, so people are paying us to do that. Whereas in um, GI Bill, it actually turns out that we would be paying them 
to participate in that because they're getting the partial wage for that program, right? Correct. And, and the only reason that would be beneficial for you to initiate that process now, if that was the path you wanted to go down, because you can have it exist on paper and not roll it out until you actually have a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. But the, the work that you do to get approved mm -hmm. as an apprenticeship is very similar to the work that you would have to do to get approved for the on the job training. Um, and, and, and so if I, if I list them out in order of least effort to most effort, the least effort mm -hmm. is the on the job training pathway. Most effort is the education pathway and the apprenticeship mm -hmm. is in the middle or at least red tape, I should say. Yeah. And what about the, so you, you're thinking that getting hired is the route, but I, I definitely question that because I, I see the partnership potential where the incentive for the university is us potentially giving, bringing students to their doors. They own it. People are actually enrolled at a university that we partner with, right? But the university pays us because we're actually running the program, right? So that's, I don't see that that has to be where I'm um, employed. And the, the negative about employment means that they control basically what you do. So here it's about partnership more entrepreneurial route where each agent is free as opposed to an employee of the other. Right. Um, it, it, yeah, it, I, I completely see. So regardless of which of, of what form this takes and, and we can table the apprenticeship idea for now because I, th I think it's complicating things. Um, even if what we're proposing here is a standalone program for which there's mm -hmm. some arrangement with the, the university and there's some external funding, right? Those are the those are really the two ingredients that uh, would constitute a win for on the veteran side. It doesn't necessarily have to be G, be the GI Bill. Um, we still have to take your vision for what this experience is and mm -hmm. turn it into a structured, you know, yeah. ta task list with uh, milestones and you know performance outcomes and. and and all the other buzzwords that um, yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. Now, does it? Do we have to specify? Okay, this is at the high school, bachelor's, tech school, grad school. Nope, nope. The <clears throat> the requirements for the GI Bill, and again, this is just one subset of funding we could look into, are uh, U.S. citizen over eighteen, and then you can impose whatever additional education or experience requirements you want on top of that. Um, but if, if federal approval for the GI Bill is not the primary concern, then don't even worry about constraints on who could attend based on education or age or you know, status or anything like that. Um, and, and I guess what I'm saying is, let's translate your vision first into something digestible and then we can figure out the best pathway forward because that's yeah. the common ingredient to all um yeah i think there's a there's a research opportunity in the sense of since we're still scoping out the the, the high level here what, can we frame it as a hybrid collaboration hybrid distributed collaboration is it necessary that the students show up on site specific to missouri or can they participate in this learning adventure uh, in, in any other fab space uh, under the curriculum that we design, in which case it would be closer to the distributed collaboration as a structural point, the idea being that being distributed will uh, engender some kind of R&D to make it work better, more smoothly. So even if we're not explicit about the R&D part, some of it will happen anyway, just by nature of how we organize ourselves. Is that a question for me? In both. I, I, are we stuck to a specific place or can it be a decentralized distributed learning? Uh, oh, well, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not opposed to being distributed too because you definitely want the hands-on thing because to do real stuff, you got to have some plant of some sort. But yeah, we could. I think we can play with whatever com combo works, right? Because any fab space that has the, you know, most of the tools that you have could host the students and they would be in a yeah. relationship with, with us to follow the curriculum as a cohort. 
It's, it's like yeah. the university having multiple campuses, which many do, right? Like, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's doable. And does that, does that affect our discussion right now to distill this? It's just meta, meta discussion. The answer is yeah. Is that, is that satisfactory? But, I mean, I don't know. I'm curious, John, is, is it, are we stuck to a place? In your no, 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 no. I, I think what we want to talk about is, um, is, is what, like, like the actual what and why, not so uh -huh. much how. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. So in a research context, you start with the question. There's some. There's some basic question that you want to answer, right? like when these people make uh, their applications for grants, I would suppose this would be a similar effort if we want to be more research biased. It's like maybe list a bunch of questions. So part of the process would be, is there something that we're curious about to declare that first as part, like the first two weeks of the, the program? I, I propose that here, a slide uh, six, project selection. So imagine you give the, the opportunity to the students to self-organize and choose the scale that they want to operate in. And first you define the kind of project you want to design build. You start there. I like that. And we're still talking about the seed eco home, right? Um. Well, we don't have to, if this is about, I would say, I don't know, I, I still have another question. What if this, the audience, like, how does this look for tech school? I talked to um, one of our advisors is, um, used to be Dr. Joshua Pierce from Michigan Tech, who's doing open source research. But he said that to set up a tech school might be it's not, not serious, not as serious requirements as something else, like, like college type curriculum are where does that fall in like the this is one of the things that we can do like uh, regarding tech school and are the rules there different or this uh, is yeah For, if we're talking gi bill it's considered a proprietary education institution and it is beholden to the same rules that we've already laid out um uh, and that that is Missouri Department of Higher Ed approval for two years continuously continuous operation. And so, mm -hmm. you know, from the perspective of it, and I apologize to be sort of the stick in the mud um, in yeah. this conversation. I feel like I'm slowing stuff down, but like really to play devil's advocate from the position of credentialing agencies, let's say, yeah. they're going to want to know like what's the certificate, how are people going to use this to contribute to the economy. And they're not on. They're not really going to understand open source or changing the world. And and when they hear stuff like that, they're going to be saying to themselves, "Yeah, but how are they making money? Or what? Which you know, are they going to go work for GE? Is that how this works? That like that's how they're. That's the sort of the the constraint on their their thinking. And so. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that helps, but like, I still think that there's a way to articulate what you're talking about just in a more practical sense um, for mm -hmm. them in which the, the value is self-evident. Because if you tell somebody over the course of six months, we're going to take somebody who's never done CAD to the point where they're building their own 3D printer, that in itself mm -hmm. conveys the type of value that, that we would, you know, that, that yeah. anyone can understand. Um. Well, does it make sense? So the CD gom I mean, that's pretty ambitious. Like just from like all kinds of practical purposes, what if what if we just say technical education and 3D printing? Because that's something that I think we're decent at and plugs into something like the, with a CD gom it may be something a little more more explaining, but technical training around the 3D printer, that's like so easy to pull off in terms of just fitting, checking the boxes. What do you guys think? I, I think starting simple uh, just to get something on paper on the yeah. ground is probably the way to go. Yeah. And, and like this, well, the, 
the the challenge I see from from my perspective, having no previous knowledge of this, is the seed eco home means a lot to you and to the to yeah. the people who who conceive of it. But from the, on paper, really, it's you're teaching somebody how to build a home. And yes, yeah. it's unique because it's of, of the, the, the process that we go through, but that in itself is self-evident in terms of value to apprentice slash student and, you know, economy, right? So, so like, even if your course was just build a home, that in itself would qualify, check. We just check the box. You're going to teach somebody how to build a home. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually... Actually, I would then go back to the home because uh, we have more assets on that that are readily visible and and editable and clean upable. Yeah, we have more assets on on the CD Eco home. Great. Yeah, let's let's stick to that. So okay. we're gonna teach building. Yeah. So it, so you're teaching building and like there's probably phases, right? We already talked about the value chain. It, I would call it orientation. Right, like, like, why are we doing this? Um, what is the process, start to finish? What are we going to be thinking about? How is this going to work in terms of collaboration? And then there's going to be a uh, step into, I'm guessing it's design after that, or pro project selection yeah. and then design, right? And so, yeah. if we're just thinking the high level categories, once it's designed in CAD, then what is it? Fact straight to fabrication. Uh, once we design it, we can build. I mean, that's workshop stuff. Okay. workshop so you get in the shop put on your hard hat and get out the cordless drills and saws and you do it okay um and then yeah let's keep going down this vein so so you're you're in the process of building and then do you have qaqc along the way um walk me through sort of how you would envision practically speaking that that work the build. Yeah. So what I would envision is that we have a complete set of CAD blueprints, instructionals, build cheat sheets, as well as quality control documents, meaning that like, say there's a management track in this builder program, there's quality control. That's a management function where you have to understand, okay, how it's built, but you can go through checklists. So basically detailed checklists that relate to the CAD uh, that can be drawn out of the, like the CAD is the universal thing. The CAD slash BOM slash build instructions are like this holy trio that once you have that, they all feed and, and correlate with one another. And uh, you can generate all the other assets from it, like fab drawings or quality control and, uh, procedures. Um, you, we teach about workflow, like layout of workshop, you know, tool organization, Yeah, now, now we're going. Now we're cooking. Now we're go we're flying. Let's go. Let's go. Next five <laughs> minutes, we've got the curriculum. Yeah, because uh, I can work with this, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, in terms of percentage between team forming, orientation, the high level, designing, and building, how, what percentage of a let's call it six month period would you envision each of those, you know, take? No, I think we got to take two years. Two years, yeah, even better. Two years, man, two years. Because here we're finding out that it's uh, it's an overload for six months. We're too ambitious here. Yeah. I want people getting a full capacity to understand both collaboration, like collaborative design, and the actual build part. And since this program, this tech school is going to be unique. It's not going to teach you how to build. It's going to teach you like at least like when people identify with that, at least some of the enterprise aspect, here's how you do this. Here's you can, how you be a, a contractor, a simple builder, or now a community builder who works with governments and community economic development foundations to make impact in their community. So there's like this social enterprise track. Okay. Um, are you presenting any information upfront uh, curriculum wise in terms of like building science? So like, this is why we're going to put the vapor barrier between these layers, or this is why we insulate the outside before the cladding. Okay. Or is that intended to be, uh, because the CAD is already done, is that intended to just be sort of learn as you go? 
No, of course, we're going to emphasize that because that gets you into calculations, which are essential to any design. We teach people how to design. So we've got a design, but it's a construction set. So in order to manipulate a construction set, you have to know design rationales, design rules. To generate, to operate at that level, you have to know how to calculate things and understand building science, material science. Applied engineering. We'll teach you how to do calculate foundation loads, like foundation, mm -hmm. like how do you tell this foundation that's X by Y, uh, whatever it is, and it's rebar in there, how strong is it? How much is it going to flex when you put this building on it, either C, B, or light frame construction? We're going to go over all of that. That's why we need two years. Perfect. Yeah, these, that, that's the detail that we need here. This, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So uh, you bring people in, they've never worked together before, and so you're team forming and combining foundational knowledge, that foundational knowledge is the science and the rules and the, the, what the, the intellectual tools they need to sort of understand the application. Um, and at that point, they're gonna start participating and driving the direction through project selection. And then they're going to immerse themselves in the actual design process. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I would say that the selection of project i think at this level we do do it simple simple means that there's like 40 different permutations of this house let me show you this con this concept here um there's a lot of different models you could build so you can start right now we've got this so-called rosebud model two-story thousand square feet with an attached garage but you can do all kinds of geometries just at the thousand square foot level so let me show you that concept there um conceptual design, possible shapes. So possible shapes here, um, design, so you design whole range of house models. So that would be looking like that. Take a look at that link. Um, that leads you to, it's just boxes, but those are configurations of a house, which all of those things could be very different. Like it could be a single story, kind of court, even a courtyard structure. It could be detached four small units. Those are all permutations that actually make sense. They would be aesthetic, functional buildings. Uh, the rosebud is shown in that item number three, the arrow that points there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's basically two-story. The, the dark means it's a two-story part. The light means it's just one story. And I was up oh. there today. Man, it's like 30 <laughs> feet at the top. We're in the treetops. It's awesome. What, what's, uh, what cat are you using? Oh, why free cat, of course. Okay. Yeah, so this is that's the other part. So we are going to use open design software, which enables us to collaborate openly with anyone in the world and allows us to extend this to any functionality we need. So FreeCAD allows us, <clears throat> FreeCAD already has all kinds of add-ons and then getting it, we, we can get into things like finite element analysis for structural or even thermal and other things. So it's a fully extendable, extensible thing, <clears throat> uh, program, which is written in Python so if you're interested in Python programming, we can get you an introduction of how to actually design, uh, create design workbenches within FreeCAD itself. Uh, that could be a, a track. I mean, that's advanced track involves programming, but we're actually doing that. We're, we're starting to design, like for example, if you want to design a house, here's the icons. You just drop down your modules from the toolbar and you design your house. That's the kind of stuff we're working on right now. Okay. So, for example, a research project would be if a person uh, is into that direction, a research project there could be, oh, yeah, we actually do this designer within FreeCAD, as, which allows you to make real, buildable models that extract, do things like extract bills of materials automatically. Like, that's pretty high-level functionality there. Um, that's already um, 
a basic method to do that is already available and we've developed. Now, is the the enterprise the integration of sort of enterprise and revenue and how you turn this into a scalable business is that also a part of foundational knowledge? Yeah, I mean, I call it foundational knowledge because we we can pitch this, we can advertise this. This is a tech school that is unlike any other tech school because tech schools typically make you an employee. Mm -hmm. uh, here we're saying. No, 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 we teach you more and therefore you can go on your own. We encourage you to go on your own. But if you want to be an employee, well, sure, go ahead. Uh, you can still use the skills that you gain to build things. But we favor that people take charge of their destinies in self-determination theory uh, by capturing more of their value. We're going to be teaching the entrepreneurial mindset. Okay, so so let's talk. Uh, let's keep on along the same vein. Um, we made it up to the build phase and we, we left off talking about um, sort of the QAQC integration, uh, yeah. operationalizing the CAD, uh, synchronizing all the different trades, um, and then sort of pick up from there and go. Okay, well, what, what do you get out of CAD? You're going to generate build and uh, basically uh, fabrication drawings from it, including assets that are required for drawing up building plans for the building department. We're going to teach you all of that in two years. I'm going to teach you how to build this and also how to uh, basically kind of like it's, an, it's a low-level architecture program where it's not architecture because we, we're not in an architecture school, but, but we teach you actually how to generate the blueprints, generate the, the package that you submit to the building department. Um, and that comes out of FreeCAD and other open source software where, where we develop templates. We work on templates. Uh, now, the biggest part there that, like when I look at the outcome of a program like this that makes it unique is the, is the capacity to collaborate globally. And that is, so we, we, we do talk about collaborative literacy, how to use wikis and open source software and live editable docs such as what you're using right now to collaborate. It's a lot about, basic techniques and a mindset that says to you, oh, well, when I'm designing this, why don't I collaborate with people around the world that make my design better? That's the basic proposition. It's like, why reinvent the wheel? Why not actually get into collaborative enterprise where you're generating assets relevant to the enterprise together? And that we call distributive enterprise. So that's a, that's like a, an it's an economics term, you can say, but the unique thing is that, okay, so people are encouraged to become entrepreneurial, but also to uh, collaborate on those enterprises with the whole cohort in their, in their, their whole class. And all the other classes are going to go through this program. So it's like building a family of people who are collab like super cooperators around the world. So that's, I think we want to pitch that as we're talking about yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. So, for the government, that's you know, no. Still, the government loves loves uh, collaboration, like global collaboration, applied skill sets, um, all those buzzwords. We can use all of those, but we're actually doing it. So, yeah, you're, um, you're actually you're creating a great marketing campaign uh, for when I start going live on Instagram. <laughs> it's all these veterans who who you want to capture here. Um, yeah. But still in the frame of day one, I know nothing to day 700, I built a house. Yeah. Um, what else goes in there? Yeah. 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 Uh, what else goes in there is you have to do, you have to learn about tool use and safety. So yeah. we're going to cover a range of, of tools that are, then explain, like, we teach you ins and outs of all the tools that are required. Uh, besides that, um, besides the tooling, I think the workflow concepts are very important. So what are, that goes back to the design method, how we design, but um, workflow for, so we teach about workflow for efficiency. So how do you design your workshop 
your build site, um, or however you're producing this to be most optimal using the best practice. For It's not just you just go out there and build. Well, there's, there's ways you can do that very effectively. It's like five... Um, it's um, like on a shop floor. Like, what's what are the known words for that? There's there's six sigma for regarding quality control, but we're literally because this is um, full digital models. We are, I mean, technically speaking, we are actually after six sigma. We might be at like two sigma right now in terms of like six sigma quality control. Like, we can, we'll teach about that. How do you? Um, yeah, we can definitely teach about that. How do you minimize um, rejects or mi minimize failure in, in your build? Uh, so that's that's part of quality control. Okay. Who else is there? There's understanding materials. So how to work with different materials. Um, we can definitely have a track on other construction materials. Like for example, we've done the brick press. So we can have a track that's dedicated to housing that are made of compressed earth block. So we, you have two variants. One is the basic stick frame version, and then there's the, the compressed earth block version. So I think that's within the scope of the two years because so we'll be rolling out the compressed earth block product next year. So that timing is good. At the housing product, not the machine itself, but the housing product. Now, uh, the other thing that people can... Uh, dive into a little bit is machine design because we build the tractors and brick presses, power cube, power units, loaders, backhoes, other things. Uh, we do that kind of stuff. So now I don't know where that fits in the two-year program because that's getting a little too much. I mean, for ambitious students who want, might want to take on that as a research project, yeah, build your own tractor. Sure. We do that yeah. in a few days. We can teach you. Like people who are ambitious or like really uh fast learners they can we have a lot of part so people will learn how to work with part libraries of existing design that allows you like legos to create new designs so that's called the part libraries we use those we develop and use those and continuously evolve them that goes back to the global collaboration part we're we're stepping into a process where it's all about continuous improvement. So this is where we are right now, but you're actually in this program, you're learning how to collaborate so that you can be part of that development uh, when the program so-called ends. No, it's just the beginning of your engagement of lifelong learning. Is the goal to have the house built at the very end or once it's built, is there going to be some component afterwards in terms of testing? Um, you know we're probably we'll probably build three of those during the program like okay i would like to i would like to include that we're actually building for a real client like we're practicing at home we're we're doing that at home at the at the home site but to get the enterprise side like the real build experience why not build for a regular for a client that's part of the training so you see what it's really like in in the real world and go so basically the class can go through that process they can participate uh, in all the aspects of that from like, we can have a class project where we actually start from scratch, from zero and we build a house for a client. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll be more like the management track, but uh, we, we can do like collaboratively in a two-year phase. Yeah, now if we have 24 students or so, uh, easy. That's easy to do. We we uh, look for a client and we build a house in a nearby vicinity, like within an hour or two from our site. So we, which we actually can do by building, pre-building the modules in a fact factory, uh, quotes like setting, because it's a modular design, and we can truck them to the site, or we can actually build on the site itself. Um, uh, there's so, a cohort starting every year, I, I presume, or every six months, right? Which means that they could stack up so you sorry so an older uh, six months is what but I, I don't know i'm asking if that makes sense imagine a new cohort a new two-year cohort starts every six months i then like it yeah as you move That's through right. you see how far ahead the previous class has gone with, with respect to building their house i love it 
Yeah, but in six months, they're going to have a house built, definitely. So the next cohort will be like, okay, what improvements are we making to this? What systems are we adding to it? Are we mm -hmm. learning about renewable energy with the solar energy system that comes as a stock option with a house? So I didn't talk about many of the features of the house, but this is also a program in renewable energy if you want to learn how to install a, a photovoltaic system. Um, now, are we getting off track if we add start adding the aquaponic greenhouse? Yeah, that's like more that's more like the elective part where if you want to do a project, because we do have all the designs for the aquaponic greenhouse and people can learn to build that if they want. But once again, it's like, uh, you know, ideally it'll be like you, you, you have the core learning and because it's two years, you can easily do like a six month development project where your, your final project is your presentation and you actually developed and built some improvement upon the system. So, I mean, this this here gets into more like quite different than what a typical tech school does. But yeah, um, that would be great. <clears throat> okay, so let me just plant a flag sort of where my head is right now. Each one of the, so in, in foundational knowledge alone, uh, building science, um, that could that in itself could be broken out into sub points or you know tasks let's say and hours assigned to it very easily and i, I could probably do that um, offline but to do that for each one of the things we covered would be an extremely robust curriculum from the perspective of you know approving agencies let's say um, so let, help, I guess help me understand in a pr like more practical sense from where we are today to when you want to have the first cohort. Um, it, you know how how you you mentioned building a house in six months. So would it make sense for the fir the first step to be that a, a six month design build course that you know and that's where we start. Would, would that make sense? Yeah. Um, are you saying we're moving not not from this two year thing, but six months? Well, I'm saying yeah. that to flesh out everything that is already on here in the type of detail that we could just get. I mean, er, you, everything you're talking about could be broken down into extreme detail and operationalized into whatever length course that you want to make it. And I'm exactly. just asking, practically speaking. You know, what do you think the realistic next step is to get to the two-year course that is the ultimate goal or the four-year course? Well, but I don't understand the question. I mean, are we we're we're designing a curriculum that, um, yeah, I guess that that begs a question here. So, what are we doing here? Uh, are we actually designing the? <laughs> the yeah actually that's a very basic question I, i'm actually not clear what where are we going so say we do this curriculum we develop it do we actually now run it for this two-year period just with students that we find whatever wh however we mark it right is that the idea here because we're already doing the six-month immersion right now We've had another three month, like a couple of years ago. We have had the summer of extreme design build back in, back in 2014. We've run courses continuously throughout the, the decade. But um, what exactly uh, are we doing here? Like, how are we, pre how are we, yeah, I I'm a little confused. How are we pitching this to, okay, so, so we're, we're going to write this curriculum and are we actually going to, run this program is that part of the deal like run it right now prior to getting it approved is that uh, i guess then sequen sequencing and timing is the question for me yeah with, with caution i would say yes so i i think i think the most realistic path is the the six month program you're already running we get it to the the uh 
the minimum standard we need to get it GI Bill approved under the on the job training program because it's six months. But that can happen concurrently with building a broader two to four year curriculum that achieves your your bigger vision. Um, the the OJT approval though still runs into the question of it's on the job. So it would be treating people as though they're getting paid to go through this, which is I don't think feasible in the short term from what I understand. So um, yeah, this, this definitely needs to be something we think about in terms of like practical next steps. I still believe though, that if we can formalize this enough, not just forget the government for a second, we just formalize it enough to say like, if you sh to communicate to the students, if you show up, this is what you're gonna do. Um, that in itself, you know, allowing me to just go to the veteran community to share that alone would be a good next step. Um, right. And what's what happens from that when you share that? Uh, are you saying that people are actually going to sign up for our, our ongoing apprenticeship or like, how do you look at it? Yeah, I mean, I, I am I, every day I discover new new buckets of funding that the military is creating for things outside the GI Bill. And so okay. the hard part historically has been getting the veteran to commit to a, an unconventional path something that's not an Uber driver or a FedEx delivery man or, you know, um, and so I think if we solve the problem of veteran interest in this, which to me is really just packaging this in a way to be like, come to, come to Missouri, you're going to pay some money, but this is what you're going to get in return. You never know who's going to sign up for that. Um, and you're out of the population of veterans, you're really not looking for that many. You're looking for individually motivated people who um, this resonates with, which is a really narrow sliver. And so um, even if you don't get anybody to sign up, I can still gauge interest in a way that is useful in terms of like what the feedback is from the veteran community on just even hearing about this potential opportunity. Because I'll tell you right now, if I go, if I went to my soldiers and I said, would you move to a farm? Would you leave the military, move to a farm, learn how to build a house and learn a STEM education and how to be an entrepreneur? They, there's no question that they would have done that. Now, the really the practical limitation is whether or not they can afford the, the, the money. But you know, imagine if 20 veterans respond to me and say, sign me up now, how do I pay for it? And then we can take that and go to somebody that has you know, some external funding source and be like, we have veterans ready to do this now. We have a curriculum. This is what it looks like. We just need the money. That's a different, that to me is probably the quickest path. Outside of GI Bill? Correct. Uh, just for your reference as well, there's two, since I published our first video with you and Brian, two people have asked me, when do I sign up? I want to sign up right now if you can take the GI Bill. Actually, a third, two, two then, but there were like two more before, like other years of people were asking, do you accept GI Bill? And I said, sorry, we're not set up yet. So like right now, already after our video, we've, we've had two people say, hey, uh, I'm signing up today if you've got it. Um, so uh, in, in my like uh, other lines of effort I have going on, I'm meeting um, hopefully soon with a joint, uh, the director of a joint venture between the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration who's running, just stood up a new transition assistance program. Yeah. Um, and so I think he would have some insight. And so I, I guess what I'm saying is I may be in circles sometime soon to be able to ask these questions, but expectation management, like I am so small and independent and outside of where the, the decisions actually get made in the circle that yeah. I can't answer that question for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you go back to the concerns that vets have it's like maybe we can design for these objections yeah absolutely so yeah. um if you're it, you know it, it it stratifies pretty clearly based on uh socioeconomic status so if you're 18 to 35 and you don't have a college degree which is the plurality of veterans that leave the military every year your primary concern is most often financial hardship and 
loss of sense of identity when you leave the military. Um, the the like work ethic and perseverance and value system are are really strong in that community, but a lot of times they don't they're not able to act on that because you know hierarchy of needs they don't know how they're going to put food on the table which leads them to the gig economy and um less um the the, the easier jobs to get but the less uh the harder jobs to to retain and build careers out of and so what's resonated so far um has been some combination of skill training income and service and i, I use a, the lowercase s so like participating in a community of like-minded people, feeling like you're accomplishing something for a greater good. That's how you really get to the root of the problem a lot of times, which is like that loss of sense of identity and community when they take the uniform off, which this, everything we talk about has that in spades. Um, yeah, I, I, I um, my hypothesis is that the, the money is easy to find. It's, the, it's unlocking that veteran community that's gonna be the tough part but um, the key, in my opinion, at least the first step is content that I can share far and wide as a new opportunity, a new model for how you transition. And through that strategy, the existing transition assistance programs would come to us. We wouldn't have to lobby them to say, hey, I've got this new idea and you should fund it. What, we, what it will be is, all of these veterans want to go do this and we have our house in order. Like, are, are you willing to be a partner or, or, you know, get in line because so many people want to partner with us with us. But, but in terms of maybe location, it's like, have you heard them? Because it, there's a social reintegration challenge, right? You've been away, you want to come back. Why would you go to Missouri when you want to reintegrate back, you know, catch up with your old friends? So like the, you know those kinds of objections what, what do you hear at that level um there is a small percentage of people i've worked with personally who geography is the least of their concern i know a guy i worked with a guy who left his family in florida to go train to become a strength and conditioning coach in texas and then boston because that's how passionate he was about that career field uh -huh. and you're also talking about a population of people who have been deployed overseas six months to 15 months on a rotating basis for the past, gosh, 20 years. And so um, you can sell geographic relocation under the right circumstances to the right population. Um, but those type of logistic concerns, I think iron themselves out once you solve the initial problem of veteran awareness and interest. At least that's my that's my theory about that. So so I guess like the short answer to your question is those people are out there who are geographically flexible. Um, it's simply a matter of getting their interest first and letting the the logistic concerns sort of iron themselves. Do you find that they have an anti affinity to each other? So do they do they enjoy meeting vets or do they want to meet different people? No. It, yeah. Yeah, there, there is inner service rivalry when you're in the uniform. And then when you become a veteran, it's like finding a, you know, a, a, a sense of connection with somebody regardless of what they did in the military. So um, in my experience, it's been very communal. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's, so I'm wondering maybe, you know, the fact that we could have different kinds of individuals participate that are not vets, is that a plus? Is that an attractor? I, is that something that makes the whole thing appealing? I think it's neutral. neutral. I think it's neutral. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Sorry, I think it's a little, you know, my, my gut says that the type of veteran who would be interested in this opportunity as Martin just would, would describe it is the type of veteran that's open to new experiences and meeting new people for sure. One of the challenges that we face here is that this type of course is um, an experience is so new and and outside of the norm that there I you know the few veterans I've mentioned this to their initial reaction was like wait 
like like it's hard for them to conceive coming from like an institutional mindset that there could be so much freedom in how you would go about building a career and a, and a you know and learning together um and it's almost like convincing them that it's a real thing wow I mean, to me, it's totally normal, but like, um, I, I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, to give you a sense, like just to paint a picture, you're, you know, an 18 year old kid from a small town and your only adult experience has been conditioned blind obedience. And then you mix in some like head trauma, some like actual life trauma related to combat potentially. You really don't have a great sense of who you are in the world when you take the uniform off. And so um, all of your all of your decisions are dictated to you almost for the most and so they're they're crying out for for agency and empowerment, but they just don't know how to get over that initial hump of operating outside of a very structured environment. Um, and so that's one of the challenges that I've encountered with every veteran I've worked with so far. And it's something that even I went through and I had a college degree and was in a leadership position when I left the military. So um, yeah, it, it's complex, squishy human stuff. It's rough to, in my experience, trying to onboard other people to open collaboration. It's, I, don't, I don't see an easy path. It's very rough. I don't know, maybe Martin has seen some other kind of uh, softer onboarding cycles, but it, for example, like there's groups like Ladies Learning Code and, and whatnot, you know? Uh, so there, there's multidimensional stuff there, but for instance, they just sometimes feel anxious simply because there's a guy in the room kind of thing, right? I'm like, I don't know how to solve that. I'm a guy, I, I know the stuff. You're trying to learn from me, but I still don't know how to bridge that gap. Right. So I, I suppose, I imagine that there's something equivalent to, to, to this uh, class of folks that you just described. I don't know how to address that. Maybe we need different kind of help. Like uh, uh, the, the vets, do they work with some social psychologists? Some, um, is there, what, what social work kind of help or occupational therapy stuff uh, is, perhaps assistive in their reintegration that maybe could be a partner for us. Uh, kind of like how we thought of the university, maybe this other group could be the partner. Yeah, and we are just the conduit of them putting their hands on and collaborating, but we're, we're in the frame of, of uh, soft onboarding rather than like hardcore uh, open source where everybody speaks their mind and like uh, swears at each other. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if the everyone speaks their mind and swears at each other, you're referring to like the way that you like open collaboration actually works. Is, is mm -hmm. that, yeah. Um, you just described the operational facility for every infantry unit in the army. So, <laughs> so, so what, what I'll say is like collaboration and teamwork is the thing that veterans do best. Yeah. <clears throat> And, and so I, I don't think it's a, a stretch to put them in an environment of open collaboration. Like that is essentially basic training. You, you're assigned a buddy. You, if you are ever arms reach away from them, you do push-ups. Like it, the, the idea of team is deeply embedded into their psyche. Um, I think that the harder challenge again is just going back to that like, hey guys, this is a real thing. You can go learn how to build a house. You really literally just have to show up with the right attitude. So we're really like, so this is really a psychological question. It's not like the other things like, oh, there's a funding mechanism for this. Like that's all secondary. The first is people showing up and getting through the psychology. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to, to diminish the importance of structuring of operationalizing what's in your head. Cause I think that's really important um, to, to make it real for them. Um, but yes, the, the site, that question of psychology is at the center of what Allies Incorporated does that no other veteran service organization has figured out yet. And I wouldn't say we figured it out either. Um, but yeah, I, 
I, I think, I think I, as cheesy as it sounds like the content matters, um, the social media is really where these conversations are happening. Um, and like my stamp of credibility is good, but it'd be even better to have, to have your Ted talk thrown up and be like, get, you get to go work with Margin, right? Like that you're, you could become like a, a celebrity guru for a certain class of veteran who could never conceive of this as a real opportunity. Yeah. That reminds me, I was looking at, at your Instagram uh, and Facebook. Do you have like, are there photos of what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, that would speak volumes. Uh, the closest to that is, is called uh, Open Source Ecology Workshops Facebook group. Okay. Uh, here's the link. We are getting like we're videotaping everything. Like we've got like three or four or five time lapses going on right now. I haven't been uploading mine lately. I've just been too busy. But if you look at the YouTube channel, oh man, I think a good thing would be one, take a look at the videos on our website. Two, get feeds from the YouTube feed. Like we do time lapses. Like I upload time lapses like a lot. So do that. Um, that would be a good thing. And then the workshops. So OSC YouTube. Yeah, I mean, this is like a media manager that could actually continue this free. Man, if you want to do that, that would be awesome. <laughs> you want to just keep feeding this stuff through. Yeah, that's that would be cool. <clears throat> uh, we don't have a de dedicated person that does that. We Eventually, we should. Yeah, it, that, that's a very easy place to start for me um, because this turning this uh, into the training plan is going to take some time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those, those need to be concurrent lines of effort. Uh, th does it help to think in terms of like outcomes, uh, maybe quarterly, right? like or out? Because it's it's hard to measure impact, right? Which we're all, we're all after it, but maybe some output, some outcomes can be defined. Like what would those be? See, so here we say a bunch of things that we're going to do, but we don't know, and we, why we're doing them. We don't know what we value uh, if it was done correctly or there's some, some artifact created of at a split. It's like, would it help to define those ums? And, and the two year is pretty arbitrary. There's some people who are self-motivated can finish the whole curriculum in, in six months. Do they get still get paid for the two years if they finish early? Uh, so I'll, I'll try to address the first question. Um, in, in terms of outcomes, the, the two big outcomes that I think really Cover, cover that base for the veteran community are you're going to build a home and you're going to become an entrepreneur or have the option to be employed. Um, the additional outcomes we could consider, and I don't know if this is getting too down in the weeds of credentialism, but it's like, you're going to learn how to weld. You're going to learn how to frame. You're going to learn how to plumb. You're going to learn how to do basic electrical work. You're going to learn CAD. And it's almost like a merit badge. Like, in the army, we had badges and skill identifiers for everything that we did um, for like practical and historical reasons. You could implement something along those lines of like, if you complete this course, this is just a, this is just the icing on the cake list of the stuff you're gonna become competent in through real life experience. Um, so that, that's another way potentially to talk outcomes to this community specifically. Um, and then, sort of making it competency-based as opposed to time-based, that is, if, if we're operating outside of the GI Bill parameters, that's completely up to Marchin and you and, and all the people running the program. Um, 
really the only time constraints come in on hours completed and tests passed are when there's taxpayer money. All right, so what, what are our next steps here? Uh, so, John, I mean, you mentioned, given what we just said, like you can basically take this and flesh it out. And it's like, effectively, you just sit on ass using, you, know, <laughs> you can take what we do and you can write any story around it because we've got it here, right? So, but what would you need from more from us to um, yeah. make that story real, like to make that story accurate. Uh, I mean, our, yeah. Uh, give me, give me a week. Let me, let me give you something in return. Let me synthesize. Let me digest and structure. And then after a week, you can redirect me, and we just iterate like that until we get it right. I, I don't know of a better way to go about it. Building training plans. Um, with risk mitigation factored into it was was what my last job in the military, it was a big component of it, was planning training. And so I feel pretty comfortable that I can turn this into a, um, almost like a military style two-year training glide path to deployment. Um, now, yeah. keeping in mind that that is uh, uh, not really the intent of open source ecology, but like that, I think it would be beneficial to operationalize it in that sense. And, and, and then you take a look at it and you say like, you're missing a whole bunch of stuff. This is, you know, uh, and we just go back and forth until we're both comfortable or until you're comfortable. Really. Yeah. It's not beyond what we want to do. I mean, we're an education organization and the, the way I see the education part is because we're linking it with pr productivity and real world applications. Um, that's what we do. We can we can wrap that around education, like lifelong learning. So, it's like my mind is open to how like how we like when we say we're education. It's like so much more than that. But if you just say education and put all the twists that we do onto it, you've got um, like John. You mentioned oh this is, might be different than what we do. Well, no, it's not. We we live a real life, right? Like it's about ultimately integrating our life and work and purpose all together. And it's like what we're talking about now, it's putting um, vehicles around it, like tapping into existing mechanisms for funding and existing resources. That's kind of what we're trying to do. Right. Um, but I'm saying that someone who has an interest in uh, structuring that, yeah, they can. They can pretty much um, write a story um, and I don't know, I, I guess we are so flexible or so comprehensive in how we approach things that what we do already will match that story. No, I, yeah, that's great. Perfect. Um, then I, I think I can run with this. Um, I think I owe you a product next Thursday. And uh, and then you can just, you know, judge me based on how, how it went, you know, and, and we'll move forward. The... Um, I think the final thing I'll say about that is is really what we're selling uh, by going through me going through this process and operationalizing it into a plan is we're selling predictability to extern just just third parties. The third parties could be the veterans. The third parties could be the uh -huh. local uh, economic chamber of commerce, right? Who may want to purchase one of these homes or or bring you into the fold of um, the housing problem in Missouri, like we're just, we're adding predictability to the, to them and giving them some certainty that's about what it is. Yeah, no, that's an interesting way to put it. Yes. Yes. We're, <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, but tell me, maybe I can, <clears throat> sorry, pump you on the, like what's, cause I thought we had a, a different idea regarding the idea of there's, veterans that could use the GI bill and we use that as leverage to negotiate with schools to say, okay, now we can do independent collaborations, partnerships, actually produce value, like bring students to, to a school and exchange. We actually get to teach this, the students. What is the challenge to that? Is it that 
the vets are not going to show up to that yet. Is that the pushback? Because I no, thought they, that was that was a common plan, but right now the, your response is like, no, nah, that may. I'm, I'm not hearing you running with it. Like when I mentioned, I called you right after that meeting, and you were like, oh yeah, this is crazy, uh, crazy yeah. stuff. But we're not yeah. really like talking about that right now. Okay, so uh, the collaboration with universities and and the exchange of your curriculum and experience for the students for GI Bill approval that already exists. Um, that collaboration, as it exists in between universities and third parties across the country, always requires, as it stands now, always requires that the third party is GI Bill certified and the school. Now, the complicating factor is that the, the approval for the educational facilities goes through two different agencies. The person I spoke to is at the bottom of one of those agencies. And so the right person in the right position of power could say, no, this is valuable, it's legit, and we're gonna do whatever we need to get the GI Bill incorporated into this. That's just okay. beyond my current ability and skill. Okay, okay, but let's back up here. So you're saying that, no, that kind of contract is not likely to happen simply because uh, the other party has to be GI Bill certified. How sure are we of that? 50% sure. And I bet you're 50% unsure. And, and so my point being that I don't, I don't, um, I wouldn't take that at all as a, anything established because this is just plain contracting in economics, right? So, Wait, no, okay, I, so I, say, isn't well let's I, I, let's explore this lo basic logic here so there's there's a university they have the power okay so a university accepts students they can accept a student that's a gi bill student it so happens if we can track this that we are actually sending students to their school because we've created a program now, of course, in agreement with that school that leverages resources of the school and of OSE, like our applied training or our facility. But all I'm saying there is they're signing up the, the university, and that may be UMKC or some other one. They are the full owner. They get paid. But they also, because we have an agreement with them, uh, they can pay us. They can choose to contract with us however they like, right? That contract could be for, um, like for example, uh, the dean told me that, oh yeah, they use uh, external facilities all the time. So I don't, I'm not seeing like why that you're saying that, oh, the other party has to be GI Bill certified. That doesn't make sense to me. If we no, just you... take like basic plain contracting and just ideas of, of kind of this out of box negotiation here. No, you're you're 100 right. Uh, I think I miscommunicated. The what it all hinges on the relationship between OSE and the school, and it has to be written yeah. in such a way that the school owns it. And and my response was yeah, based yeah. on my understanding that the school didn't want to own it. No, no, they'll have to own it. The, no, no, no question about that. The, um, yeah, they have to own it because they they've got it. They're the contract is with them. The, the payment, the GI, the government contracts with the school to pay this pay for that student. That's exactly. That. We're just saying we're going to insert our, insert ourselves in a creative way here. We're going to get another contract going with the university. Now, yeah. of course, that the challenge there is it's the relationships there and all that. Are we able to convince? The university, the individuals in authority there, whether it's a dean or somebody else who has authority uh, to to uh, to write get into this kind of contract, uh, but a person like a dean, I'm assuming they would have the ability to say, okay, well, we're going to contract um, with this entity for for some of these services. So, I, I mean, I've never done it. I, I don't know what the practice of this this is, but we can definitely pursue this in an entrepreneurial way. 
so, you know, just solving the problem. Okay, do they actually, is there a relationship there or, or there are some blocks in a way that are really difficult to get by? Um, yeah. The question, the, where do you see the value of them managing the overhead and getting the accreditation? Sorry, what's what's the question? Is, is the concern that there's too much uh, uh, management overhead that you don't want to be in and you'd rather have them handle it? Like, what, what's the value for you, for, for OSC, to have the university op, like own and operate the, the, the VA engagement GI Bill? Well, one is what you, exactly what you said. Then we can, we don't have to worry about the, the administrative overhead on that part. Mm -hmm. and, but the benefit is clear. We are getting students, i.e. development effort, because our students, we design the program. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. They go to UMKC. We design their program in any way we like, uh, pending some basic you know, some basic levels of appropriateness and all of that. Like what I envision there is they could, for example, take basic physics or they could take enterprise video marketing at UMKC. Uh -huh. We provide the rest. We give them the real deal. <laughs> so they just entered through the door at UMKC, but we got them. <laughs> Um, so like the building science stuff, for example, they could have specialized courses there, right? To complement the hands-on experience in design at OAC. Exactly. On both sides. Okay, which, I see. For which reason, I think this is quite an irresistible offer on both sides because I asked, the, so I mean, why did I say this? So I, I mean, I, I asked the Dean, what's your pain point? Well, how do you pay the bills? He said, well, we got to pay bills. We got to get students. Research is a loss, typically. Mm -hmm. uh, students pay the bills. So I said, oh, okay, you need students. I'll get you some students. <laughs> and that's, that, that's just a simple thought. It's like, well, what if we get students that actually we market through um, our contacts through the veteran community. So this is John, this is Jesse, uh, Jesse namely and John, now John here and some other people um, that another person, Jesse, has been putting me in contact with through the veterans community and military community. Um, but if we have actually some outreach and marketability to these communities, like John is saying, then we have the capacity to, yeah, to basically to create a program and populate it with people. And the university just does, does the administrative part. They get students. We get we get students, they get paid, we get paid. Um, so the economics are there to actually make this using a, from what John said is there's a whole pool of money that's not being tapped through the GI bill. And if we tap into it by a different kind of value proposition than just saying you're gonna get pumped into the mainstream, like if we can get through the psychology of the, um, of the vet that that wants this, and I, I'm biased, of course, to think that we could, because we can probably communicate a compelling story. Why do I say that? I say that because I've seen that so many times here, at our place. People get come here and they get transformed. So I've had that kind of feedback here that we're taking. I mean, the kind of feedback I get as as the leader of OSC is, man, like I didn't know this stuff existed. Thank you for existing. Um, you're changing the world. Uh, you give me hope in my life, kind of thing. Um, because it's just so it's different. It's authentic, and I can speak for that authenticity or uh, just the difference. That's I think we're, um, I mean, authentic and different. Uh, enough said on that. But I think our social capital is amazing and I, and I get that kind of feedback so i'm biased by this kind of feedback saying oh yeah man like people come here they get transformed or this has this kind of potential so i'm thinking oh, okay here's people who might need that kind of a potential i'm sure we can reach them that's called marketing and and getting the message out uh and, right. and storing um so i mean i'm biased of course for the positivity of that 
that thing. I mean, we've never done this thing, so I don't know what the reality is. But but at least from first principles, there's nothing that says that this couldn't be a a major success, a transformative thing that, I mean, literally reshapes what the vet world does exactly. while reshaping the university too. Because yeah. now the university guys are going to see, holy cow, these guys... Uh, they're actually teaching people applied stuff. They're actually collaborating at this level with us. They're actually taking courses at UMKC, which is kind of a fun. I never really thought about this kind of possibility before. This just kind of merged here in, in the new recent relationships. Um, so it's pretty crazy, but it, there's nothing a, a priori that says this wouldn't work. It's just about execution. I, I, I believe it's this is entrepreneurial. This is execution. Yeah, so from, from a, sorry, I have a, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I, 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 personally, I believe the university system is, is not as effective or, or efficient as the open source uh, collaborative economy. But so, so in that sense, we're taking a hit there. Uh, a lot of the, the, the funds will go to admin. So, yeah, so but that, that case is not made yet in my head that, that it's, that, that because there's so much uh, disruption attempt at, fighting the current education system, right? So now you would be saying, oh, come back to the old way of educating. We're compatible with it. I think that in a sense tarnishes OAC. It's, it's it not clear that the, 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 the classic education system doesn't seem to work. Uh, that's why the open source uh, collaboration like activity is sprung aside of it, outside of it, right? Yeah. Sure. There's a lot of research that's happening in universities too, but it, it's it's not what's driving the innovation in the open source world. So, so I don't see the complementary yet, but right. But it's, I, um... I, I can I can learn remotely, right? I can go to Coursera. I can go to and, and not have to be enrolled in a real university to get the same equivalent learning and credential. So the, 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 the economics doesn't add up because the tuition would be huge to go on site versus uh, consume the same content remotely with presence on OAC on site at a fraction of the tuition cost that would otherwise be the university. So, so yeah, I don't but, get the, yeah, the, yeah, but uh, uh, it appears you may be missing the point that just mm -hmm. like, for example, what the recent vet uh, who heard about the GI Bill thing, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to go to your stuff. I'd love to. I don't have the money. So okay. they can they don't have the money to do it. So so there's the answer. They're, they get they're getting funded. That's the that's the critical point. Even if it, like we charge very little, a lot of people wouldn't mm -hmm. have the money either. Um, we don't charge excessive like, you know, we're I think within reason. Um, but uh, I think it addresses that point of, of the actual funding. Like what John said, it's like, how do I put bread on my table here at that level? Mm -hmm. We're talking at that level. There's, there's kind of a lot uh, I want to respond to here. Um, the, to your point about the collaboration, what you, what you want in simple terms is you want the OSE seed eco home course to be listed on their course catalog. If you can accomplish that, then you've met the criteria for GI Bill eligible veterans to attend OSE. So whatever the criteria the university has to put OSE's course on their catalog, that's the hurdle in the, in the short term. Um, and I, I do definitely see um, the point about diluting OSE by involving with like the conventional university. But the flip side of that is OSC could actually pull the university in a more progressive direction. If the if... <laughs> you can look at it one way or the other, you can say that we're getting dragged down by them, or you can look at it they're getting uplifted by us. Right. It's up to you how you think about it. Uh, I don't. See, um, I don't particularly see like our audiences rebelling against that. I mean, in fact, let's just go back to our mission. What's our mission? Collaborative design for transparent and an inclusive of abundance. Inclusive. So actually, we go back to our mission statement on that one. 
and we say, well, this is our mission. How, how does it contradict it? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, the, the, the true transformation it occurs when you get somebody who never- Takes everybody. Can, yeah, the, the true Sorry. transformation will occur when you get somebody who's never conceived of doing this in their life, opt into it. That, that, that to me is the- Exactly. Exactly. That's that's the recent thinking, like in terms of my my own cycle development, if I could say, is that there is no us or them kind of deal. It's the our change is going to be like when companies, regular companies like John Deere, are going to be adopting our stuff because actually we're innovating faster than they are and stuff like that, um, or we're transforming universities. We're into transformative development. That's um, to do that, we have to enter the beast in various ways, not sell out any principles. We still don't sell out principles. Like for example, our core, our curriculum will be, you are required to share this and develop for the world. That in itself transforms the university upside down. The fact that they're actually developing real products in this class. I see like the positive potential of that way higher than any drag on our, on our, uh, on our credibility. It, it's funny because Paul and I started this conversation and I, I mentioned that I kind of view myself as an insurgent. Um, and in, in that sense, that's exactly what we're doing here. Yeah. So I'm not sure if we lost Marchin or if he just went on, uh, turned his video off. Uh, maybe phone uh, ran out of battery. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because everybody needs to evolve anyway. Uh, and the the the, the student debt uh, crisis in the state seems to be uh, out of out of whack. Um, but surprisingly, for this particular kind of collaboration, the money comes from the government, so it doesn't tax the student. So in in that case, <laughs> ethically, let's say. I'm, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, but like, if you good were to pay tuition, I would have an objection there. If the student were to pay tuition out of pocket to attend the university and OAC, I think that's questionable. It starts to become questionable, at least in my mind. Yeah. I, well, I think that's a really important point. Um, I also think that even though we may be pulling them up rather than them dragging us down, we always need to be worried about them dragging us down. Like, I, I, I think it would be foolish to not at least have that in the back of our minds at all times. Right, so I, but I think that's, that's part of the magic of defining the, the curriculum in such a way that it stands on its own, it's complementary to the rest of the work. And if, if it succeeds or, or not on its own, it doesn't affect the rest of the, the, the distributed uh, organization. Right. Should be back soon but um yeah like what would be i'm trying to also understand like what, at what point can i participate in this uh curriculum design thing i could try and show what we have here to some of my uh, colleagues and, and get their feedback what, what kind of feedback do you need other than marching so I'm, I'm wondering maybe uh would you need to talk to past people who experienced the, the, the programs? That would be tremendously helpful. Um, I absolutely don't intend to, to go this alone. Like I, I didn't mean to imply that I was just gonna do all that, you know, um, it, I, I very much want, um, uh, will need some help. Uh, the, March is trying to enter it, there we go. Um, the, the first step I do is actually simply organizing the information we have here. And so I think it's going to be beneficial uh, for the, like the higher level thinking about what's going into this curriculum. Um, and so I, I don't really need collaboration on that because the information's already there. It's simply just having me organize it. Um, but I don't know, like, would it make sense for me to do all of that in a way that I can just share with you like on slides or Google Sheets? Sure, yeah, any form of document works. 
Okay. Um, and to be and like to be perfectly honest with you, I don't know what type of help I'm going to need, and and I want to make it so that you can jump in whenever, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Hey, Martin, what we were wondering, like, what other kind of feedback would would be required? Like, who else do we need to talk to in the OIC or Fab Lab ecosystem to to refine this? All right. The other person has call captions enabled. Please start speaking. Can you uh, hear me now? Yes. Um, that's okay. Did you ask a question to me though? Um, oh, well, I was wondering who, who else should we talk to? Maybe past participants in OSV entourage, uh, maybe some other open source hardware shops to, to try and refine this. Um, this is like, well, who else? Could be a good what kind of other collaborator Refine which part which part uh, the, the, the curriculum this two year this page if we look at this page yes. and we wanted to refine it yeah is there right. is there maybe another university out there with an excellent applied program that we could uh right. inspire let's say the this courses let's say no universities suck <laughs> it's john I, actually actually i i can tell you uh I, I in grad school I took a, a joint course um, with the forestry school and architecture school that was uh, building a um, I think it was called green building no it was um, they went out to an island that the university owned and built a research station but it was done in the least um, environmentally impactful way possible and it, it they do have a structure that was taught by the architecture school so I can reach out and see if um, uh, the professor might have some some insight I guess yeah. Well, John, what, what are your hopes for what you think you can accomplish? What, what I can accomplish is turning this into a structured plan. Yeah. And so you're, you're going to end up with a, almost an outline format, tasks categorized, uh, maybe performance measures and, and approximate hours dedicated to each. Um, and so it'll just be a framework and then hopefully something that other collaborators can add on to and, and jump into. Um, I'm deliberately going to be, um, uh, I guess, sort of like hierarchical, uh, simply because that's the, the clearest form. If we're talking about college curriculum or apprenticeship approval or any sort of external agency that's gonna look at this, but um, yeah. hopefully that won't be too limiting. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think you can do it, do it all. Or it's like, this is not that hard. It just takes somebody doing it. Like we've got all the ingredients. We're already doing a lot of it and just structuring, just restructuring a little bit. I, I don't see we have a form super formidable task. It's just, can somebody take the time to do that? No. That's me. I, I, I can. <laughs> yeah. I think we got it. The answer is right here in this room. This global playhouse of open collaboration. Paul, where are you? For everyone. I'm in Montreal. Awesome. Okay. A moment, yeah. Okay. Uh, I feel like I have right. my marching orders. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for collaborating. This is great. We're going to change the world. Awesome. All right. I'll keep you in the loop. And uh, Paul, I've got your email, so I'll, I'll uh, share any new documents I make with you. <laughs> All right. Sweet. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for the effort. All right. Take mm -hmm. care. Bye. Take care.